Hello everyone and welcome all of you to Nikki Lyle Creative Presents of Industry Leaders where today I'm joined by John Cockley from uh, Hanson Frank. Welcome John, do you mind um, telling us a bit about yourself quickly? Yeah, my name's uh, John Cockley. I'm one of the co one of two co-founders um, of Hanson Frank, which is a illustration agency which we founded and started um, 10 years ago. We represent a, a, a a group of um, illustrators, animators, image makers um, based all over the world. And essentially what we do is we find, find them work and, and work with them on, on commercial projects. My first question is, I've read that um, the idea came to you in the pub. So just <laughs> yeah, where all good of. ideas come from, right? And, um, but I'd like to, to know a bit more about your career before that point. So would you mind telling us a bit about that? No, I, I, I feel like a a complete charting really because I have no background in you know I didn't study art I did art GCSE and that was the end of my kind of artistic um, academic career I went to university I studied um, linguistics and English language and then I kind of fell into a career in publishing and I was I was I was on the sort of sales side of things in publishing so I was essentially selling selling advertising in, in magazines and I found myself working for a company called Centaur and working on quite a kind of dry um, direct marketing magazine, which was great fun at the time, but um, ultimately not what I wanted to do. And I was very aware that there was this, um, you know, kind of fate, I guess. There was this other magazine over the other side of, of, of the office called Creative Review and also Design Week. And I didn't really know much about advertising or creativity or, or the design sector, but I was kind of drawn towards it. And I spent I spent kind of nine to 12 months trying to navigate myself across the office <laughs> to go and sit with, with these guys, which I eventually managed to do. Um, and I ended up working for Creative Review for the best part of, of 10 years, really, and um, going from being the, the sales guy selling the small recruitment ads in the back to, to running their um, commercial um, offerings across the board, really, but running kind of um, the advertising team, basically. So that was my background, but during during the you know coming to the end of that period, I was very conscious that you know there was a few things going on in my personal life, and um, I was about to become a dad, and I was very conscious that I didn't want to stay in publishing forever. I didn't want to commute forever. I'd, I'd, I'd moved out of London, so I had this idea about becoming an illustration agent, and it was essentially based on the fact that I'd met lots of illustrators, um, and I loved what they did, and I also had an understanding of their world, but also. I could see that a lot of them weren't particularly enjoying or comfortable with, with selling themselves um, and operate, you know, and running themselves as a, as a business. They were much more interested in the creative side of things. So that was kind of the catalyst for, for starting it. And uh, I, my business partner, Tom, who's my cousin, I approached Tom because he, he was a, a digital designer working for uh, in advertising. Um, to be honest, essentially, I thought, well, who, who do I know that can build me a website? Um, and I thought Tom might, you know, mates, rates, family kind of deal. <laughs> so we went to the pub and had a chat and it, and it really escalated from there. And, and the more we talked about it, the more we realized that we had a much better chance if we kind of collaborated. And he had the advertising design agency background. I had a sales publishing background and we felt the two of us made a good mix. Um, and that was really, the, you know what the start and end of it that that evening in the pub that's kind of where we got to brilliant and where does the name Hanson frank come from so frank uh so as i said tom is my cousin our, our mums are sisters um and frank was was their father so frank was our grandfather that's a long-winded way of saying that but um frank was was our grandfather we felt it would be nice to name the company after him mm. firstly um but also we wanted to have a company that had a kind of family ethos and some of the qualities of, of, of being a family and being a, you know, not a huge sprawling group, but a closer, more personal sized agency. So we like the idea of bringing that name in. Um, and yeah, he was a, he was a dashing gentleman late into his nineties. So uh, handsome just seemed to fit. That's so interesting. Do you know, I had a, a granddad called Frank and my first bet <laughs> like teddy bear was called Frank. There you yeah. go. <laughs> It's a great name and it's you know it's nice i really it's funny because you name a company and you 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 have to make that decision quite quickly but yeah. actually it's a, a decision with real permanence yeah. but i'm really pleased we did it and he's i mean he's not around anymore but it, it 
kind of um it's a nice story and it kind of seems to keep his legacy alive a bit so yeah definitely and so what were the early stages of Hanson Frank like when you set up the business just winging it to be completely honest we had very little to show for ourselves we didn't really we we had you know if you looked at our cvs we had nothing really to prove we could do this we didn't have a website we didn't have um any money or any uh financial support so it was really a, a case of set, getting people excited about the idea and um finding artists who who would kind of take that leap of faith a lot of well quite a few of the people we signed at the very start certainly in the first year or so is still with us now and that's great, and I'm, I'm eternally grateful to those people for kind of um, taking that leap and giving us a chance. Because it was really just a case of us saying, look, we think we can do this, you know, we've got this idea, we think we can make it work, we've, we've got a couple of points of difference, we feel, and, and slight tweaks to the model that we think will help us. Um, but essentially, you know, let's try this together. Um, we won't cost you anything. We'll work really really hard and, and do our best to, to represent you as best we can and hopefully we can kind of succeed together and what were those tweaks what was the edge that you had at that time one of the things that we we did was we slightly tweaked the traditional agency model the tr traditional um, agency model in the illustration world is that you 100 percent of your income goes through your agent so regardless of whether a project comes to you direct or regardless of whether you have an ongoing relationship with somebody as soon as you sign with an agent 100% of your income go, goes through the agency and is subject to the agency's um, fee structure. And we kind of looked at that and thought, well, it's not particularly fair to start with. We, we're just starting out, but um, a lot of the illustrators that were interested in signing have been doing this for two or three or four or five years. They've built up a network. They're already doing really well. They've already got a, a, a black book of contacts. We'd change it and we'd say, look, any of the work that you get directly based on the relationships you already have or the things that you're doing, you can keep. Um, what we're going to do is go out there and find you more work and together we can grow, you know, help grow your, your business by adding more, not taking what you're going to get anyway. So I think that was a, an advantage and I think that allowed us, because I think a lot of artists saw that as a fairer deal, that allowed us probably in the early days to sign people that were possibly a bit out of our league, to be honest, you know, because I think they looked at it and thought, well, this is a fairer structure. So I, you know, I'll take a chance on these guys. And what's been really nice over the years is that that to this day um, remains the case with our contract. And, and I, as far as I know, there's some other agencies doing the same now. But what a lot of artists do is they hand over any inquiry they get anyway, regardless. Now, there's no obligation for them to do that. So they don't resent it. They don't um, feel they have to. But they kind of value what, what we're doing for them. And I think they value their time and they realise that actually... It's probably a better use of their time to pass everything to us and for us to sort it through and work things out and come back to them with the concrete offers of work than it is to spend their own time doing that. So that's been really nice. And um, like I say, there's no obligation to do that. But the fact that people do kind of makes me think, well, the service we offer and, and the fee that we take is, is a, you know, is, is merited. It's like the business side. Whenever I work with, say, graphic designers and I help them like, negotiate like fees and mm -hmm. things like that, if you are a creative, you're not always going to be the best person at having those kind of more challenging conversations sometimes. So it can be... Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's an incredibly... Uh, for, for a creative person in any capacity, if you're making something or creating something and you're putting your heart and soul into it and love, um, it's very hard to then talk about it commercially and, and kind of monetize it and, and and be able to have a conversation about it. And I think that's why agents exist. And I think that's why agents are positive for an artist because they take that conversation away. We, we can have that conversation in, in a slightly different way, which is less personal, if you like. In a good way, it's removing the emotion from things. A lot of artists have said to me what they like about having an agent is a client can get in touch we'll then go away and negotiate and crunch the numbers and work things out and um, work out the contract and push back on things, get everything into shape. And then when the creative process starts, the artist kind of walks into the room, either physically or figuratively, and they're like a breath of fresh air. You know, the artist has arrived and there's none of this baggage because they've not been the person negotiating the contract. You know, we've been the difficult ones or the awkward ones or the people, you know, trying to move things. And the artist is then, they don't, 
start the creative process with any of that that baggage yeah that's that is essential isn't it for a creative to be able to go in and as you say just be like hey i'm here to deliver the creative work yeah. and everything else is being taken care of so how do you attract artists nowadays do people come to you or do you reach out to, to certain creatives that you see that you want to represent i mean yeah lots of people get in touch which is incredibly flattering and um you know we have like an online submissions um folder and literally on a daily basis people are tweeting us or sending us work on instagram which is awesome and you know we look at all of it it's getting i would say for us as an agency with our structure and our plan and our kind of vision for growth it's getting harder and harder for us to find people and that's for a number of reasons one reason i kind of mentioned before i mean we're we're 38 artists now we're not small but there are certainly other agencies out there that are 100 or 200 or 300 illustrators our vision for hans and frank is to maintain a relatively small size our ethos is that within that group there shouldn't be people who are too similar to each other you know we don't want um two or three people who do the same thing we don't you know we feel like the, the illustration world is competitive enough as it is so we would rather just represent one person in a particular area um and you know that's that they're, they're the handsome frank person for this style of illustration we don't want to kind of have you know people queuing up to do a job so that's one of the things so it's getting harder for us to find people because we need people who are um obviously very good at what they do and very professional and it's it's hard to find people that aren't already represented it's hard to find people that fit into our group and fit into the group um in terms of visually in terms of style but also who don't overlap on what we already have as time has gone by we've probably come away from the model of people approaching us and us signing them although it does occasionally happen but we're a little bit more strategic about identifying what we need and what gaps we have and then going out and trying to find them and so you also have like an overseas presence as well with like yeah. artists how did you build that up to be honest um when we started the company my my i mean i kind of thought this was going to be a uk business working with uk clients and uk artists you know i wasn't i wasn't really thinking internationally at the start and i remember about a year into things we got an email overnight i woke up and had an email from um sachi and sachi in los angeles and it was like wow like this kind of blew our minds we were like you know somebody on the other side of the world wants to work with us and actually obviously what has transpired over time is that illustration is a fantastic export if you like british scene whether the artists are british or whether they're artists that have come through british art schools or certainly at one point lived in london i think that's that is a scene of art that is is admired internationally and other countries are kind of looking to see what's going on here as a barometer of what's cool and what's what's exciting and what's next we started to sign artists um in the uk and then we started to gain clients internationally obviously what we realized was that because of the nature of our business and, and, and the way that people work and the fact that files can be sent digitally, it was incredibly easy to work internationally. You know, there were really no barriers to it. So that led us to, you know, I guess, more proactively courting business from abroad and, and you know, actually going to the States and, and meeting people and going to other places in Europe and, and meeting with, with clients there, building that up. And then naturally the next step was, well, you know, why would we limit ourselves to working with, um, artists just in the UK if we can work with clients anywhere we can work with artists anywhere so that kind of you know really broadened things and also I think what's what's been really interesting is being an illustrator does allow you to have quite a transient lifestyle and to move around and a lot of our artists who we originally met in London sort of seven or eight years ago have since left and and kind of spread all over the world and moved to kind of far-flung places because they have the ability to work from anywhere so why wouldn't they? So that's kind of given us an international presence as well. The fact that, you know, this group has kind of spread across the globe. So now we have people in Japan and Australia and in the States, all across Europe. Um, we've got a bit of a, a hub in Barcelona, four or five artists in Barcelona, people in Paris. So it's just become a lot more um, widespread. And, it, you know, that often the, the client will be in the US and the artist will be somewhere else in Europe or vice versa. Um, but being in the UK really works because obviously we're well placed in terms of international timelines to, to manage projects on either side. That's one of the questions I was going to ask is how do you manage the time zones and the differences as well? 
you, you have to become flexible. I mean, I don't really do a traditional nine to five. It depends what I'm working on. I might be working on something um, with a, a Korean client or an Australian client, which requires me to jump on a call early in the morning. Often we're working with West Coast clients. Increasingly, we're working with West Coast clients. So obviously those conversations are going on later into the evening. What we try and do is be very, very flexible. Um, we, we, we have to be willing to jump on a call whenever required, but then you kind of take your breaks when they come. And I think I've got a lot better at thinking, well, three o'clock in the afternoon here, um, there's nothing going on. So I'm going to take a couple of hours off now because I know I'll be working later rather than sort of sitting at a desk from nine to five in that very traditional way so yeah just learning to manage your time and, and being willing to to jump on a call early or late if required it's not it's not every day um but i think part of the role of an agent is to be constantly um contactable you know and i think that's something we're good at as an agency um if you need us we'll, we'll answer the phone whether it's um you know the middle of the night or sunday morning or you know, whenever and how do you go about gathering new business I was having a conversation about this yesterday with somebody and I think what's been a kind of evolution in, in the illustration world and probably in the broader business world is that it, it's no longer about this kind of who you know um, ethos. I think being an illustration agent maybe 15 or 20 years ago was um, probably about being based in Soho, having a little black book of contacts, taking people out for nice lunches, really kind of that whining and dining and having those close personal contacts with people. To be honest, the industry is not really like that anymore. I don't think anyone has time to have a three hour Friday lunch. So it's become less about who you know and it's become more about who knows you. And, and we work very, very hard to get our name out there as an agency so that people know who we are. I mean, what I like about illustration, and like I said before, I come from a sales background, but I, I never feel like I'm selling anything. I, I feel like it's very, very soft. It's just, you know, the approach is, here we are, this is what we do, this is who we represent. You, you might need an illustrator next week, you might need an illustrator in five years, but when you do need an illustrator, please you know, consider us. So that, that's been our philosophy. And um, I think secondary to that, what we've tried to do is rather than advertise or um, do marketing in some of the traditional ways, going to shows or going to events or paying to be in annual books, we're great believers in kind of creating your own media. From very early on, we've published an annual newspaper that we've um, written and um, designed and created ourselves and distributed ourselves. We commissioned a series of films, so I think we're up to film number 11 now, um, and they're all on our website. A series of artist films that are completely um, funded by us and just essentially a marketing tool to tell a story about an artist and show where they come from and their process. But yeah, and, and a lot of the kind of exhibitions and things we've done over the years, we, you know, we, we would always rather do something that we have ownership of than kind of pay, pay money to, to jump onto somebody else's event or somebody else's publication. And I think that serves us served us quite well in terms of getting our name out there and getting our brand out there. Um, and would you say with like social media, like how it's different from, it was more about who you knew, knew back in the day and take out for lunch and stuff, that it's more important to have engage more online with like Twitter and Instagram? Absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, I was looking the other day and I think in Instagram actually started the year that we founded the agency. I think Instagram is also 10 years old Twitter, and Twitter was also relatively young. And I think because we were um, a new agency then, just starting out, we were very quickly onto social platforms, probably quicker than some of the more established illustration agencies that have been around since the 70s and were perhaps a little bit more resident to jump onto social media. And that, you know, in, in all honesty, that allowed us to, to grow a really big following quite quickly. And that's great. I love what Twitter and Instagram does for us. I think they great tools um i think twitter there's a fantastic community of illustrators on there and i think you know and, and again when i go back to the start and i think about the fact that we were essentially outsiders you know we didn't have illustration backgrounds that community on twitter was incredibly welcoming and um positive and encouraging and is to this day really and i'd recommend to any illustrator that you kind of get involved in that and um you know reach out to, to, to people on there because it's it's really helpful if you're a, an individual working at home on your own and instagram has been great you know instagram is in many ways the perfect tool for an illustration agent you know it's so visual it's about it's about you know sending incredible imagery out there into the universe
I do think there are cons of, of social media and I do think I've kind of talked about and written a little bit about um, what I perceive as some of the negative um, side effects of Instagram for artists and illustrators. No, you know, I think I would say to anyone is don't kind of put all your eggs in one basket, you know, don't um, obsess about one platform and, and build your business based on one platform because you, you don't ultimately have control of that. You could lose your audience there at any point or that platform could disappear or the, the, the kind of popularity of that platform could completely fade away and you know who knows what we're all going to be looking at in five or ten years every morning on our phones yeah engage use these platforms get involved with them have an audience build an audience but be mindful of the fact that things will move on and you can't just rely on one place yeah that's so true about being a bit more diverse with um with where you are like the dots is also quite good um i've been looking to develop like a mailing list myself because of things like twitter um like instagram you can't always rely that it's going to be there like you say john like these technologies change all the time we actually connected because of something i put out on twitter yeah we very kindly tweeted offering to help so yeah thank you for that and was, yeah i think that was michael at, at, at build yeah had replied so i saw it yeah you, you know and twitter's been great and, and so many positive conversations and things have happened off the back of picking up a conversation on twitter so i am but i am very on the whole i'm very pro social media i think it's helped us a lot i think being a creative as well it's all about your voice and getting your voice out there and what makes you you and that's where things like twitter can be quite good so going on to that initial post that was me asking for help for junior creative so that's my yeah. next question is what advice would you give to junior illustrators anyone that's watching this at the moment that's trying to get into the industry obviously it's it's incredibly hard to kind of to break through and get noticed and you know we've talked a little bit about social media and, and yes i think you should be engaging with those things but you know you have to be kind of uh, mindful of the fact that it's very hard to build a following when i look back over my 10 years of doing this and i think about the people who approached us that stick, sticks in my mind it's always the people that take a bit of a risk and do something a bit different and do something that's memorable i remember we had one guy one grad one year we didn't sign him actually but um he sent us like this package um, and it was all a bit of a joke he sent us a few messages on twitter but essentially in, in this box that was tied up with a bow was a pair of gold pants um <laughs> so it was memorable I've had somebody else get in touch um, and they've sent me, you know, they've kind of been on Twitter and um, found out my dog's name and they've drawn my dog and sent me like a, a, a picture of the dog. And I think that level of thought and that level of um, personalization is, is kind of that extra hook you need really to, to become a bit more memorable. What I would suggest to any um, junior creative or anyone looking to kind of stand out from the crowd, it would be to really do your research really think about who you want to approach and who you want to talk to and who you want to work with and then think about how you can communicate that to that person or to that company in a kind of bespoke personalized way that won't feel like um just a generic postcard or just a generic dear sir madam email that's being pumped out to lots and lots of different companies because I think it's, you know, over time, they're the people that, that stand out in your mind and, and that you remember and become memorable. And if somebody goes to the time and effort to send me something that is clearly uh, a one-off and has clearly thought has gone into it, wh whether we end up signing them or not, I'm, I'm going to make some time to have a conversation with them. I'm going to reply to them. I'm going to engage with them. I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to ignore that. And I think it's, it's that, that's kind of the key to it, isn't it? It's forcing sending someone on something so good or so interesting or so um, strange that it forces them to engage with it. That's so true because all the advice I give to people that reach out to companies, if you've taken the time to do it properly, people will take the time to reply to you because I've been, like loads of people are looking for work at the moment and like my heart goes out to everyone, it's rubbish. This is why I started right, like running mm. these events actually was to have industry leaders such as yourself and us having these conversations with people about how do they find work and yeah, take the time to be noticed and someone will take the time to respond to you but we all receive those, hi, sir, madam, sometimes the wrong company name. Yeah. You know, I'd love to be represented by you. It's, 
yeah. it's the little things isn't it and you know just little things like be, receiving an email no matter how well it's written but when you can see in the top bar that it's been sent to 20 other illustration agents um no look we end up, i completely understand that that's happening but it just takes a little bit more thought and attention and care to send 20 separate emails with a couple of lines in that talk about specifically why they're interested in your agency and that really helps and i think that that just points towards the fact or alludes to the fact that this person really cares or is really focused and is really um, specifically interested. You know, it's flattery, isn't it, really? And I think everybody wants to think um, or feel that, that somebody is specifically interested in working with them. That's, that's just a, a positive thing to convey. That's, that's the top tip I always give is tell a company why you want to work for yeah. them specifically uh, above everyone else even if you're sending different companies different things saying why you want to work there, but just make it personal at the time yeah yeah and you know we, we completely understand nobody nobody's gonna be crazy enough to sit there and think well i'll write one email and send that and sit back and wait for them to say yes but just that time and effort i think really does show and and what advice would you give to illustrators at this moment in time with like the pandemic and um how they can keep like upskilling themselves at this moment. Um, obviously, what's happened with the pandemic has had such wide-reaching um, ramifications for every industry and every walk of life, and we're not in any way isolated from that. What I would say is that illustrators and animators, on the grand scheme of things, are relatively well placed. Um, we can work remotely, and 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 many illustrators and animators do. It's not like you're working in a factory or a, um, in a, or in a shop and you have to go to a certain place every day. During lockdown, you can work. The opportunities that are out there, you know, we, what we've seen over the past three months is we've had a lot of clients coming to us and saying, you know, we've got this brief and it was gonna be a um, photo shoot or it was gonna be um, filmed, you know, it was gonna be a live um, film kind of advert or whatever it was. But we can't do that because, you know, we can't shoot on location and we can't get models and we can't do what we wanted to do. So we're going to use illustration instead or we're going to animate it instead. And we're going to, you know, we want you to, to take this storyboard and animate it because we can't work with actors. Um, so in a funny way, our kind of little corner of the universe has had a, a little bit of a, a, a win there, I think, um, because it's, it's made brands that wouldn't previously have considered illustration and animation it's made them kind of sit up and take notice of um, what's possible and you know what can be achieved when you can't go down the traditional routes. When it comes to upskilling, I think if you are, I mean, one of the big shifts for Hanson Frank over the past couple of years, and you'll see more of this coming, is that we're moving more and more into animation. I would advise any illustrator out there, you know, even if you don't want to animate your work just at least have an understanding of how animation works and an understanding of how you would like your work to move um as and when those opportunities come about you know and perhaps you collaborate with a freelance animator and um, do something together you know you don't have to be the animator but just showing that your work can move and that you understand how it can move is really really important 60 70 percent of the projects we do now the work will move in some on some level whether that's you know short kind of gif movement for social media up to kind of full-blown animated tv spots um and everything kind of in between animation is definitely something people should be looking at and if you have more time on your hands because of the situation i think that would be a great way to spend a bit of that time i'm hearing that a lot at the moment from different agencies not even just in illustration like digital agencies as well and um, like the founder of Analog Folk that I spoke to yesterday said, if you can learn like motion, After Effects, yeah. animation, you're going to be, um, it's going to be a huge competitive advantage for you. And that's, that's really a point about even if you partner up, even if you find someone that's, that's got those skills and you get on very well creatively, they might be a good person to collaborate with. A lot of our illustrators um, have a preferred go-to person who, who is essentially their animator. So as soon as a brief comes in with the mentions motion or movement for a specific artist, you know, I'll know who we're going to bring in to kind of make this sort of little dream team. If you can find somebody that understands your work and understands the way you want your work to come to life, is considerate of your, the, I think it, what it comes down to, you know, any, 
any animator can make illustration move. You know, that's fairly um, simple. But it's understanding the nuances and the being respectful of the style and bringing it to life in a way that is respectful of the original style, that is the real skill. And if you can find an animator that, that you connect with and, and it, you know you can work with on that level, then the two of you can have a lot of success together, really. And you can find work for each other and it becomes almost like a little partnership. Like when you have um, digital designers with developer friends and they become yeah. like a little dream team on every yeah. project because the design is just really tight because they know the flow of how to work together. Exactly, um, yeah. Where, where are you finding that the work is at the moment? Because it's quite, is it quite tough in the UK? Are you finding there's more work in the States? I mean, the US is a big market for us um, and has been really the past two or three years. We, we work on a April 1st to March 31st financial year. And to, to be totally honest, Q1, so April, um, May, June, has been a really tough quarter. There's been not necessarily less work, um, when I look at the stats, we're, we, you know, we've not done a huge amount in terms of invoice projects. It's just the average price of those projects is down. A lot of big ad campaigns just haven't happened. I mean, you only have to walk down a high street and see empty billboards to realise that um, people aren't commissioning um, out of home ad campaigns. Why would they? The streets are empty. So a lot of that kind of top end of the market is gone. It certainly has over the past three week, uh, three three months. But actually, moving forward, um, in terms of work in progress right now, I think we're in a really good place, and there seems to be a lot going on. And that's you know a lot of that is US, but also um, in the UK, we're working on some stuff in Canada at the moment, some stuff in Australia. Um, so quite a spread really, and I haven't I haven't really noticed any changes in the geography of of, of the work. Um, I just think we, what we saw temporarily was the bigger projects, the things that have more investment involved, probably more, more kind of stakeholders and more sign off involved, more levels of sign off. They were the things that people were getting nervous about and probably not committing to and going ahead with that they were previously. I think advertising is really struggling at the moment when I yes. speak to my clients in that space, they're either making redundancies or it's just, it's not the best at the moment for them and there seems to be a lot of pitching at the moment but it's not really materializing into actual work yeah that's i mean that's been the funny thing because um i think we're all in this situation you talk to your friends and some of your friends are furloughed and doing not much and then you speak to other friends who are busier than ever you know and yeah. i've got friends that work in um the nhs or you know and obviously they're insanely busy i think that our position in um, our little corner of the world is we don't feel any less busy. We're not receiving less emails. We're not sending any less quotes. It's just less, less things have been coming off. There's been a, a I guess, a feeling of kind of caution, I guess, really, and, and everybody sort of waiting to see what's going to happen before they'll commit to anything. And look, that's completely understandable. I appreciate that. But I would say, you know, I'm, I'm really not doom and gloom. I really feel like um, there is work there and opportunities there for illustrators and animators. Like I said before, I feel like there were opportunities available that probably three months ago weren't there because they would have been um, a different creative execution. There are some positives. Definitely working from home, reaching out to different clients where you don't have to be within that country, within timeframes in Europe is much easier. I think like non-committal is a word I'm hearing a lot in regards to things yeah. actually sticking, but every like industry leader I've spoken to, such as yourself, has said that they're expecting a bumpy ride this quarter, but Q4, there's predictions that that's going to be when it's going to be more on the up and, and recovery. Yeah, I mean, who knows? Like, truth, truth be told, I've never written a business plan in my life. We don't obsess about the bigger picture. We're very, we, you know, we focus on our artists and trying to find the best opportunities for them. Nobody can be isolated from, from the bigger picture, but as certain above the line advertising spend has waned over the years, it's increased elsewhere. I mean, two or three years ago, we were probably doing very little in terms of bespoke social media campaigns. I mean, now, one of the side effects of lockdown is everyone's spending more time looking at a screen. So the audience is there. Um, the audience is kind of hungry for content and brands are increasingly waking up to the fact that they can't just use their social media channel to rehash things they've done for elsewhere. They want 
they want bespoke content that's created for a smaller screen and that's opened up huge opportunities. Things are constantly changing and evolving and moving regardless of what's happening right now. What future developments can we look out for in regards to Handsome Frank? We're, we're working on a new website which has been going on a while <laughs> so it's it's not ready yet and actually you know I don't I don't I feel like we're in a good position really because the website we have is perfectly fine um but yeah we're working on a new website and we want to get that right and we hope to be launching that in in the autumn so that's kind of our next big thing um we're definitely and you'll see this from the website and you'll sort of see this in the way we talk about ourselves and communicate and the kind of content we put out there but we're very much trying one well, i wouldn't even say making a move into animation we've been doing a lot of animation for the past couple of years we probably just haven't been that good at communicating it we are looking to really push animation and um, to communicate the fact that you can come to us for animation and if you like any of our artists, any of them can can be animated. So that's a big thing for us. So um, you'll probably see more around that. As soon as we're able to, we want to be back out there um, making films. We recorded five or six podcasts before lockdown, um, which we really enjoyed. Um, so we want to get back out there and, and record some more podcasts and just get back to doing things how we do them really which is working closely with our artists telling their stories and working very kind of collaboratively to try and find them opportunities part of our ethos as an agency is that we don't you know it's not just about finding work it's about finding the right work and the right opportunities for the right artists helping to kind of guide their career i guess that's what we want to be doing more of and hopefully as, as things spark back into life there'll be more opportunities out there and um we can get back to some more some sort of more, more normality yeah sounds amazing thank you so much john i really that's appreciate right. you answering all those questions for me so we're just going to jump into the q a section now so if any of you have any burning questions for john just ask those and um so let's do they, do they come up in chat or yeah i've got them okay yeah so um so first question is you mentioned that when you started out illustrations illustrators sorry tend to have contracts already i have completed a number of professional commissions but at what point do you feel someone is ready for an agent that's really interesting actually um because I think a mistake that some artists make is they feel straight away on graduating, you know, I need an agent. There's a real like, they feel like that's the first thing they need to do. And actually, I think that's not the case. I think you're very wise, actually, on, on many levels, not to rush approaching an agent. I think you can approach an agent too soon if your work isn't kind of fully formed and you've not fully found your style. I think most established agents, unless they see something really that really kind of grabs them, I think most established agents want to see that somebody's done commercial work um, because they want to see somebody that is already doing it for themselves. You know, it's, it's not, you know, agents aren't miracle workers. We, we can't take any artist that we decide to sign and suddenly turn them into a big commercial success. Um, what we'll do is, help people on a path that they were already going down anyway you know we'll hopefully accelerate that path and we'll hopefully help them to achieve bigger things but i think if you're going to achieve you're going to achieve regardless of nation the other important thing to consider is um you should have a go at being your own agent you should understand marketing you should understand contracts you should understand negotiating fees because if you don't understand these things if you sign up with an agent, you don't really know what they're doing for you. You're not going to have an appreciation of it. You're not going to have an idea of whether they're doing it well. What's important in that, in that question is, you know, when is the right time? And I think the right time is when you've proved to yourself that you understand the industry and the business, when you can take a portfolio of work that is not only a, a great portfolio of work, but a portfolio of work that has commercial case studies within it, and you can go to an agent and say, look, I've worked with this person. I've worked with these people. I know that my work is relevant. I know that my work has commercial appeal. You should want to sign me. Then that's a, that's a much more um, emphatic argument than going to somebody and saying, you know, I've never, I, I haven't got anything to show. I've just got this, this portfolio. You're much better off waiting and biding your time. Developing your style as an artist. Yes. You know, your voice as a creative first. Getting some commercial projects under your belt. 
and then going to an agency and saying I think so yeah I think so and don't and don't rush it you know that there is no urgent need to get an agent you know there are lots of our artists and illustrators out there who are very successful who don't have agents it's not for everyone you know you don't you shouldn't feel like that is an objective that you have to certainly that you have to achieve straight away uh, or even maybe ever you might decide that you, you don't want an agent and you want to be in control of every aspect of your career it's not a, a, a necessity do you find that um sometimes maybe having an agent might pigeonhole you with a distinct style and push you down a certain route with certain projects and clients perhaps one of the issues is we're an agency so handsome frank we represent 38 people what we have to communicate fairly quickly is what each of those person does and i always feel a bit bad saying this but we have to kind of encapsulate into two or three images what this artist does what this artist does what this artist does and what that means actually is that we're kind of narrowing down the breadth of someone's work often what you'll find is the, the work that you'll see on our site is a more kind of tightly curated body of work than perhaps a wider body of work that you might see on the artist's personal site. Like I say, the obvious reason is that we just need to quickly communicate to people coming to our site what somebody does um, so they can understand that quickly. A good agent will allow and encourage an artist to evolve their style over time um, and that is a process I've been through with a number of my illustrators. There are different ways to do that. Some of them have literally come to us after a couple of years and, and said I want to delete my profile and start again. So at that point obviously you have a, an existing relationship with the person but you're always starting from scratch so you have to look at this new style and work out together whether it's right for the agency or and this is probably my preferred way of, of doing it it's it's a constant evolution you know, so it's constantly tweaking your style and changing it and pushing it in a new direction over the years in quite a subtle way. But to a point where when you look back five years later, you realise that actually there's been quite a leap from where someone was to where they've gone. And that keeps things interesting for our clients. That keeps things interesting for the artists themselves. Um, and that's probably my preferred way of doing it. And I think a good agent will allow their artists to to do that and to experiment and to push things and to try things. So another question is on to animation. So when it comes to animation, what would you say is a programme that is industry standard? So out of like After Effects, Toon Boom, Procreate, etc. I, I don't think there is an industry standard in truth. Um, it's the same with illustration. You know, with illustration, some of our roster work in Illustrator, some work in Photoshop. So depending on what those initial files look like, that would obviously have, that would dictate how they're animated. I'm hearing a lot of really positive things about Procreate at the moment. I know a lot of people are saying that they've made the switch to Procreate and one of the reasons they've done that is because it's easy to, easier to animate and that animation process is, is more straightforward. So I think that's, you know, if you're starting out, that's something worth looking at at the moment and, and having a play with and seeing if that works for you. Ultimately, the the style of animation is going to be dictated by the brief. The style that is required for the brief is going to be the biggest factor in deciding how a piece of work is animated. So that would be more of a creative decision than a decision that would come from us. Next question is, what's the best way to find clients without an agent? Social media is great and having a presence is, is very positive. Um, I think it's really important to have your own portfolio website and not just rely on um, other platforms and don't don't just have a Behance profile don't just have an Instagram account have all of these things you know try and spread yourself across the internet as widely as you can I think by having your own portfolio website you'll always have a corner of the internet which is yours and that you have ownership of um, and we talked about you know the popularity of certain platforms coming and going if you maintain your own space, you'll always have that. If you're starting out, word of mouth is, is, is huge. By working with clients and um, doing a good job, and then at the end of that project, talking to them and saying, you know, if you like what I've done, then please recommend me to other peers or colleagues or friends. Um, word of mouth is huge. If you have a positive experience working with somebody, then you're gonna be very likely to kind of pass that on. That would be my main things. I think. What I would suggest is if, if there are specific people you want to work with, you should try and target them in a, in a as I've mentioned before, in a, in a, a kind of bespoke 
targeted ways. For example, if you want to be an editorial illustrator, you know, your style of illustration is not going to appeal to every magazine and newspaper on the newsstand. Be realistic, you know, have a look, identify the publications that are commissioning work that looks like yours, find out who the art director is and send them something personalised that, that explains why you want to work with them. I think you're much better off sending 10 hand-signed, hand-numbered, beautiful prints to somebody as a, as a kind of beautiful gift that no one's going to dare throw away than you are just pumping out a thousand postcards doing something that's very disposable. I think research is like the number one thing, isn't it? It's kind yeah. of looking into a company, why you want to work with them in a very strategic, intelligent, thoughtful approach so that it won't be something that you'll just throw away like you say John because if ever anyone sends me something printed depending on like the quality I'll always investigate oh this is so yeah. lovely can I help this well, person how can I and if I can't help them I'll call them up and say thank you so much here's some feedback and that's yeah I think it's I'm always like I always hark back to when I worked at Creative Review and I sat next to the editorial team and obviously they're their post box you know back 10 years ago when people posted things more than they do even now and every day the post would arrive you know a pile of posts unless something really stood out and had love and thought and attention and care got into it it was disposable send something that that nobody would dare throw in the bin something that is clearly got that love and care has gone into it and that will get somebody's attention you might become inundated with portraits of your dog oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It seems like we've, we've covered everything, really. So, um, yeah, again, thank you so much, John. No I do problem. appreciate your time. And I hope that everyone that's tuned in today has, has got something out of this. Take care, everyone. Um, yeah, thanks for watching, uh, everyone. Well, I think all oh, 20, 29 yeah, of you. Yeah, yeah, 29. Thanks for sticking okay. with us. <laughs> yeah. All right. Have a good weekend. Thank you, guys. See you later. Bye. Bye-bye.